right, so this morning, uh, Pastor Angel is actually out of town, and um, he will be back to teach next week for Easter Sunday. So this morning, we will be in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be in the 21st uh, chapter uh, here, and we're going to look at the first 17 verses, and the title of the message this morning is um, The Arrival of a King, The Arrival of um, of a king. But before we get into the study, let me go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this, um, we'll look at this together uh, this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time once again, Lord. It's just a beautiful time of worship, a beautiful time to just come together and to hear from you uh, through your word, Lord. And uh, we always come expectantly, Lord, just knowing that you have something for us. We know that your word never comes forth void, and um, we just come this morning we, we pray that our hearts are softened, our minds are softened, there are no distractions or whatever is maybe being an obstacle right now between us and you, that you would remove that. Fill this place, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. And I just pray this morning, Lord, that um, you would help me, Lord, to be the, the mouthpiece, the vessel, Lord, that you would use uh, to share your word, Lord. And I pray that your word would shape us, it would mold us, and just help us to leave different, Lord, from how we came in here this morning. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you once again for this opportunity. We pray these things, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Matthew chapter 21, the arrival of a king. And, you know, a few weeks ago, um, Hollywood was celebrating their whole red carpet uh, Oscars, Academy Awards events. And um, I don't watch that personally, but, you know, it's, it's a big deal secularly. And when you think about uh, the red carpet event, you know, it was weird. I think this year the carpet wasn't even red. I think it was like a champagne color. And um, I don't know why. I think for 62 years or so, um, it was traditionally red. But when you think about a red carpet event, um, traditionally, it marks the route that is taken um, by heads of state, okay, on ceremonial or formal occasions. And recently, it's, ex you know, it's been extended to VIPs and celebrities at formal um, events, uh, such as the Oscars. And when you think about the Oscars, you know, historically, there's this display of, of dazzle and celebrity personalities, um, unusual and even some questionable outfits, right, that take place there. Um, it's an opportune time for stars to share about their movies, about their, their projects, the things that are going on in their lives, and they typically have people's full attention. It's just a big entrance, a big grandiose experience. Well, about 2,000 years ago, there was a similar grandiose triumphal entrance, but it was into the city of Jerusalem. And um, there, that red carpet ceremony, if you will, it overpowers and shadows all these other red carpet events that we've experienced here on the planet. And that event took place, and the individual involved was the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was involved in that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And unlike these red carpet ceremonies, you know, Jesus wasn't dressed in expensive or fancy clothing. Like, he didn't arrive in a, you know, a large stretch limo. But rather, when you think about the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, he arrived lowly, yet with dignity, riding on a borrowed donkey, right? A colt or a young donkey, and we'll read about that this morning. And he wasn't there to promote himself. He was there to fulfill the word of God and to give us the greatest gift we could ever receive, and that's the gift of salvation. And you see, Jesus was approaching this last week of his earthly ministry, this so-called Passion Week or Holy Week, which we are you know, entering today. And within a few days, he would be crucified and he would be raised from the dead a week from that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what's interesting is this is an incident among other few incidents that are actually recorded in all four of, of the Gospels, right? So, for example, this is recorded here in Matthew chapter 21. We see it in Mark chapter 11, um, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, as well as in John chapter uh, 12, if you look there in the 12th chapter. But when you think about um, Palm Sunday, just a little bit of a background. You know, what does the Bible tell us about Palm Sunday? Well, what's interesting is that this is an event that was predicted um, hundreds of years before it actually took place. Uh, for example, scholars suggest that 
the event was actually predicted, uh, for example, in Daniel chapter 9. If you go into Daniel chapter 9, if you look there beginning in the 24th verse, um, and, and I think it goes all the way to like verse 30, I'm sorry, verse 27, what we see here is the 70 weeks prophecy or the 70 weeks of Daniel, okay? And if you look at Daniel chapter 9, there in verse 25, uh, there it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's a total of 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. So what we see here is that Daniel is informed by the angel Gabriel, okay, that after 69 weeks, and, um, and bear with me, there's a little bit of math here. Okay, so after 69 weeks or 69 sets of seven years, so 69 times seven is 483, right? Um, from the command to restore and build Jerusalem, the Messiah would appear. Okay, so after this, um, this command to restore Jerusalem, 483 years from that command, the Messiah would appear in Jerusalem. Now, some scholars suggest that this time frame aligns with Palm Sunday. And you ask, well, why does that align with Palm Sunday? Well, the command or the decree that best fits this prophecy is actually found in Nehemiah there in the second chapter. Um, other decrees focus mostly on the temple, but this specifically that we read about in Daniel refers to the city of Jerusalem. Okay, And if you remember in Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, if you look there in the first eight verses, it was the, the 20th year of the reign of the Persian king Artaxerxes, if you remember. And if you remember there, Nehemiah, he was sad. Uh, and then the king asked him, you know, hey, why are you so sad, Nehemiah? And of course, Nehemiah became very afraid. He was fearful. Um, but then he explains to the king that the city where his father's tombs were, um, he told them lied in waste and the gates were burned with fire. And then the king asked him what he would request of him. And Nehemiah asked to be sent to Judah to rebuild the city and for help with this journey and this task. So what ends up happening is uh, King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah permission, supplies, and safe passage to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the walls. And scholars suggest that this decree, this command, took place approximately in March of 445 BC, and 483 years later is the date of around April 6, 32 AD, or the day that we believe Jesus triumphantly entered into the city of Jerusalem, or Palm Sunday, the day that we're celebrating today. So this morning, as we get into the text, what we're going to see here in the Gospel of Matthew, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, we're going to look at how he arrived. That's the first thing we're going to look at. The second thing we'll look at is how he was honored. So he was honored both um, by the actions of the crowd, but also verbally by the crowd. And then the last thing we see is that Jesus, um, we'll see Jesus' actions when he enters into Jerusalem. So what I'll do first, and you know, we usually do this, let me go ahead and read the entire text. It's only 17 verses. You know, it's not like Psalm 119. So um, we'll get through it pretty, pretty quick here. Let me read this and then we'll, uh, we'll look at this verse by verse. Okay. So Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse one, uh, the word of God says, when they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees 
and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus went into the temple and threw out all those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus replied, Yes, you have never read. You have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. And um, amen. We'll stop there. All right. So the first thing we see, what we're going to look at this morning, is how Jesus um, enters into uh, the city of um, Jerusalem. So what we'll do is we'll look at the first, let's look at the first seven verses, and then we'll kind of break this down a little bit. Um, So here, beginning in verse one, it says, When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, At the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. um, Might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. So for some time now, Jesus had been going back and forth there in Galilee, in his earthly ministry. You know, he was on fire, right? He was healing people, he was performing miracles before his return to Jerusalem. And up to this point, when you think about Jesus and his earthly ministry, he kind of avoided public demonstrations. He kind of lived on the lowdown for a little bit there until this day. Now, this particular day, it was the Passover, right? They were kind of celebrating the Passover there. And some scholars suggest that there may have been nearly or over 2 million people in the city of Jerusalem. And when you think about that, it's kind of like twice the population of the city of El Paso here in far west Texas. So that's kind of a lot of people, right, as you could imagine. They're in the city of, um, of Jerusalem. And the Jews that composed or made up this, uh, this population there uh, were those that lived in Jerusalem, the crowds from Galilee, and then those who saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, um, as suggested in the Gospel of John there in the 12th chapter, verses 17 um, through 18. And when you think about the event, this particular event, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, this is the only time in his ministry that Jesus actually planned and promoted this public demonstration, okay? And you see, when you think about Jesus, all he was doing was fulfilling the scriptures to bring salvation And he came with grace. He came with mercy. Uh, But unfortunately, many refused to accept Jesus. And in fact, if you look in the Gospel of John chapter 1, there in verse 11, it reminds us that he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. And in fact, if you look at the account of Palm Sunday in the Gospel of Luke, if you look at Luke chapter 19, verse 41, It says, as he, Jesus, approached and saw the city there of Jerusalem, he wept for it. He wept for the city of Jerusalem. And what's interesting is if you compare that to the prophecy that we see in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, um, it opens with rejoice greatly. So there's kind of a contrast there from the prophecy of this taking place 
and then when it actually took place there in Luke chapter 19. And, you know, why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? Well, I think he knew the suffering that would come and kind of like this missed opportunity of salvation for the many that would reject him and they wouldn't accept him, his own people, as the word of God tells us. And eventually, Jesus' actions would force the religious leaders to destroy Jesus and fulfill the scriptures that the Lamb of God would be crucified. Now, the Word of God tells us that the next time they would see the, their king, and actually we read about this in Revelation chapter 19, would be when he would ride in with great power and glory. And of course, we know that would be after the rapture of the church and after the great tribulation period. So it wouldn't be for a long time, right? Because once Jesus leaves, once he ascends back into heaven, um, he wouldn't be back on this planet till after um, all of those events took place. Now, some people think the, the rapture of the church is his second coming, but it's not. That is just the removal of the church. His physical coming back to the planet will be after the rapture and after the great tribulation period. Now, as Jesus makes his way back to, um, to Jerusalem, what we see is he gives some specific instructions to his disciples. He says, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone questions it, say, the Lord has need of them. The disciples then bring the donkey and its colt and they laid their clothes on them and he sat on them. So what we see is that Jesus comes in riding on a donkey this colt, okay, alongside um, its mother. And if you look in verse 5 here in, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew that we're reading in this text this morning, he quotes from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and there it says, um, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. It says, Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he came in riding on an animal, this wild animal. And if you look in Psalm chapter 8, Psalm chapter 8, there in verse 6, 7, and 8, it says, You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. They're speaking of Jesus. All the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea, that passed through the currents of the seas. So the fact that Jesus rode in on this wild animal, he was able to keep the animal under control. It shows us the evidence of his kingmanship, not over mankind, but over everything, including the animals. And we see this here in, in, in Psalm chapter 8, and also as he rides into Jerusalem. But what's interesting is that in that time, you know, donkeys were usually ridden by the poor mostly reserved for those that were needy, maybe a burden to the society, not, not something you want to be maybe seen writing on in particular. And, you know, the other day I was having this conversation with my dad. We were talking about old cars. My dad really loves old cars. And um, the AMC Pacer came into the conversation. And I hear that, like that's from like the 70s, right? So like it's ancient. I don't know. That was like way before my time. I don't know if you guys had an AMC Pacer. But... He was describing this car to me. It's like this, this flying fishbowl that had no horsepower and had really poor fuel economy. And nobody wanted to be caught driving an AMC Pacer, right? Those were for, I don't know who those were reserved for. But when you think about Jesus, the donkey, right? Like nobody wanted to be riding on a donkey because of what that meant symbolically, what that meant economically and, um, and socially. So... When you think about Jesus, what I love about our Lord and Savior is that he was willing to go from glory to glory with the cross in between, with all humility, including riding into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey here. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. And that's what he did. He came to this earth as a man full of lowliness, though he was bold when he needed to be bold, right? But this was all for us, for our sins, that our sins would be forgiven. 
and that we could have life. Because of this, we have a hope and we have a future, and there's no greater love than that. And God is so good. I'm so grateful for that. I'm sure all of us in this room are grateful for, grateful for the fact that he came to the earth and did all these things which were necessary to fulfill um, the scriptures. Now, as we move on in the text, the next thing we're going to witness or going to see in our minds as we read is that the Lord is actually honored. And he's honored in two different ways. First, the multitudes, they honor him with their actions. Okay, And when I think about actions, I often think of love. Okay, So if you love someone, there's always an action that comes with that love. And we know that the greatest example of love is the Lord himself because the Lord is love, right? John 3.16 tells us, tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave, there's the action, his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And in this case, the crowds, they loved the Lord in that moment as he was coming into Jerusalem. You know, of course, in their minds, he was there for other reasons, but the Lord was there to fulfill the scriptures. And they honored him as he arrived. If you look in verse 8, it says, A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. So what we see is that some of these people, they were spreading clothes on the road as the Prince of Peace was approaching. Others cut down branches from trees is what it says here. And if you look in John's account of the event, in John chapter 12, there it tells us that these were, tree, these, these were branches from palm trees. It says there in John chapter 12, verse 12, it says, The next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. So these are the actions that gave rise to the name um, Palm Sunday, the very day we are celebrating today, this triumphal entry of the Lord into Jerusalem. So here we see their actions, but then furthermore, they honor the Lord with their, their, um, their voice. They honor him verbally. If you look at verse 9, um, 10, and, and verse 11, it says, Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? And then in verse 11, it says, The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So here we read that the crowds were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And kind of worship how we worship this morning, right? And they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Very similarly, we read about this in, in Psalm 118 version of this. But the name or the word Hosanna means, um, it means saved now. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but if you look in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 19, verse 39 through 40, and I love, I love what Luke tells us here, what Dr. Luke records for us. He says, some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And then Jesus answers, I tell you, if they were going to keep silent, the stones would cry out. So I love this. You know, a few years ago, um, I was studying uh, geophysics at, at Texas Tech University. And geophysics is basically the study of like the solid earth and like fluid in the earth. Um, I basically had my head in the ground is what it was. <laughs> um, but when you think about geophysics, um, there was a time where I did a lot of field work and um, had a bunch of rock hammers. I would go to these outcrops and like break pieces of rocks off. And I remember when I would hit the rocks, they would resonate and they made a sound. And it, to me, it was beautiful. Like, you know, I'm a rock person. The rocks were beautiful. They made a beautiful sound. And, you know, if it was like an igneous rock, like a granite or like um, a metamorphic rock, like a marble or like a, a sedimentary rock, like sandstone, it all made a different resonance and a different sound. They all had like a voice, if you want to call it that. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard like a rock slide before, down, a, down the side of a mountain. Like it's powerful, you can hear the rocks. And when I read this verse, I hear the rocks in my head, like from the time I used to study these things from God's creation. And um, I hear them crying out to the Lord. And this is beautiful because God's creation always points 
to his power and his authority and his majesty and his beauty because he created all these things. And you think about like creation right now, you go outside, you see the trees are blooming, you see the poppies out here in Kastner Range, the mountains, you know, the clouds, everything in the atmosphere, and everything glorifies the Lord. And here we have this beautiful um, personification, I think that's the word they call it in English, where you give, um, you give like um, human, human uh, characteristics to inanimate objects, but um, you can hear these things, you can see these things in your mind, and it just reminds you of how powerful the Lord is. But notice in verse 11, this is really cool because here we, we see that the multitudes, they verbally identify who this person is. Like they know who he is. They know it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And they recognize him. They knew who he was. And you might be asking yourself, well, why were they so excited to see him? Why did they love him so much in that moment? They were overwhelmed with joy as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. Well, you see, the Jews were looking for a Messiah that would end the rule of Roman occupation and would establish a physical kingdom on the earth. They wanted to be saved now, is what they wanted. However, Jesus was more concerned with establishing a heavenly kingdom, and not so much a physical earthly kingdom in that particular moment. And for this reason, the cheers from the crowds of Hosanna, save now, would eventually turn to crucify him just a few days later. And you see, God's agenda was very different from their agenda as he came into Jerusalem. And I think what we can learn from this is sometimes in our lives, God's plans and God's agenda for our lives will never match up with our own plans and our own agenda for our own lives. I know that's never been the case with me. And unfortunately, sometimes when God doesn't allow things to go our way, we tend to become disloyal to him, just like we see with these individuals and we'll see with these individuals. And that can impact our loyalty to the Lord. And maybe what that can do is we stop trusting the Lord. We stop praying to the Lord. We stop being in fellowship with the Lord. We stop coming to church. We stop being in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's something we have to be very careful of. It kind of reminded me of John the Baptist. Remember in the Gospel of Luke, um, there in the seventh chapter, remember John was thrown into prison and you know, John was perplexed, and remember he sent a messenger to Jesus to ask the Lord if he was the one to come or should they expect someone else. And of course, this was all because of the situation that he had found himself in. Like he was there in prison, and of course, this was all part of God's plan that clearly he didn't understand. And then remember what Jesus tells um, this messenger to, to report back to John. He says, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. And like, who are we to question the Lord, right? And his plans and his desires and his will. We need to just trust the Lord. And I know that that is easier said than done because sometimes it's very hard to trust the Lord because of the fact that we're in the flesh and we're selfish, and we want things to go our own way. We need to have that mindset and that heart that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Not my will, but your will be done, speaking of God the Father. And that can be very difficult. But in this particular case, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to fulfill the scriptures. To return to Jerusalem meant that ultimately he would return, or he would be going to the cross, and we know that that message of the cross is extremely powerful because that's the message that saves. And in fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians 15, in those first four verses, there the Apostle Paul speaks of the elements of the cross, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. Number three, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. And we know as believers, if you put your faith in that message wholeheartedly, there's an element of repentance in your life. You allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and, and, um, and use you. That, we know, we're found righteous in the sight of God. And we know that that message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But it's also a message that um, is of power and saving grace for us that put our faith in that message, which is truth. 
But all of this required him to return to Jerusalem. And what we're going to see in the next section, and this is kind of a little bit longer here, is um, the last thing that Jesus does there on Palm Sunday, which we are celebrating today. And what we're going to see is that he cleans house. Okay, so let's go ahead and read verse 12 and verse 13. And there it says, Jesus went into the temple. He threw out all those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. So as we know that during like the Passover, um, typically with Passover preparation, households would rid their homes of any type of leaven. And when you think about leaven, you know, leaven is kind of like this yeast-like substance that was added to dough to make it rise. Like there's this nice little chemical reaction that takes place. It makes it rise. It's really cool. And in the word of God, leaven is typically a representation of sin or, or evilness. Okay. So as people are cleaning out their homes, Jesus is also cleaning house. So he goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple out, if you want to call it that. Um, but what's really interesting is that when you think back to when Jesus began his earthly ministry, just about three years before this, he kind of opened in a similar fashion. Remember? For example, if you look at John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25, if you remember there, he also cleans house there in the temple, right? There he says, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And then remember the Jews asked him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? And then Jesus tells them that he would destroy the temple and raise it up again in three days. Of course, that statement was extremely confusing and perplexing uh, to these Jewish people because it took 46 years to build the temple. And now Jesus told them he would destroy it and raise it up again in three days. But of course, what Jesus was talking about there was the temple of his, his body, right? The resurrection of himself. Uh, which we will celebrate next week, once again, the greatest event in the history of the world. But notice that now, three years later, the temple is kind of defiled again. He has to go in there and clean house again and, and deal with all of this, this mess that these religious leaders have brought here. And, you know, that temple tax, they were using it to their advantage. They were taking advantage of people. They were, they were contaminating a lot of things there. But if you look in verse 13, he's pretty specific. He says, and here he's quoting from the book of Isaiah, there in the 56th chapter, he says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den um, of thieves. Now, when you think about this in our own personal lives, all of us, these bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit lives in us. These are the temples. And when you think about it, these temples need to be cleansed quite a bit, don't they? Typically daily, sometimes hourly, minutely. It depends on the type of day you're having. Um, but it's all because we're in the flesh. And the way we cleanse these temples is we just simply ask the Lord to forgive us. We ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Because the more we are filled with the filth of the world, the less we are filled with the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We have to cleanse our hearts. We have to cleanse our minds and, and fill it with the Lord. And when you think about it, sometimes we don't clean the temples very much. Like we go through seasons where we're not cleaning, right? We're not asking the Lord to, to come and cleanse us. And things get dirty and dirtier and dirtier. It kind of reminds me of some of my students. They tell me about their rooms. I'm like, my goodness. Like they don't clean their rooms and it just gets dirty and dirty and dirtier. So what ends up happening is things in our lives that maybe we thought we had victory over, start to become habitual again, and we start to do those things. And, and we, have to, we have to be careful. we got to cleanse those things out. And one thing that I've always struggled with, and you know, I, was, I was telling the guys on Wednesday, one thing that I, I've always struggled with since I was younger has been self-hatred. Um, and you know, before I came to the Lord, I, I hated everything about myself. I hated how I looked. I hated how I sounded. I hated just every aspect of my life. I didn't like who I was or how I was. But in the Lord, you know, you're born again, you're a new creation, and you realize how valuable you are and how loved you are in the Lord. 
But sometimes when I let the temple of the Holy Spirit, my mind and my heart, get dirty again with the world, I start to feel like that again. And I have to go in there and clean house, let the Lord come in and cleanse me and remind me of how uniquely I made and you guys are made. We're all different. We're all used for his glory, but we have to let him use us. And we have to be careful. We, got, we have to let the Lord cleanse us continuously. That way we don't go back to that place again. But God is so good because he meets us and he keeps us from going back to that dark place. He puts us back in that place again where we're just in this place of intimacy with the Lord and we can move forward with him. Um, and God is so good. So whatever is contaminating your temple this morning, the temple of the Holy Spirit, please understand that God can help you overcome anything and everything. So if there's an addiction in your life, maybe there's something you did a long time ago and you're starting to do it again. Maybe you need to restore your marriage. Your health needs to be restored. You just, whatever you need, the Lord can help you. You just, you just need to invite him back in to cleanse your mind, to cleanse your heart. And he'll help you. He'll, he'll do it again and again and again because he's done it so many times for me. And I love the Lord so much because he's been so patient with me. I'm not, I'm not exactly the, the, the most, I'm not the smartest person, guys. You know, the Lord's been so patient with me and he loves me so much. I, I don't understand why, because I don't deserve it. None of us do. None of us deserve God's love. Um, but he does and he's so good. And he'll do the same for you if he did it for me. But notice that Jesus, notice what he wanted for the temple. What he wanted for the temple then. He wanted it to be a house of prayer. But you know what? He wants to sing for this temple to be a house of prayer. Because when you think about it, prayer is really true evidence of our dependence on the Lord and our faith in the word of God. And as we pray and we give everything to the Lord, it's proof of our faith. And that's why these temples need to be cleansed and these temples need to be houses of prayer. And that's something we need to fight for every single day, right? Every single day we have to wake up and pick up our crosses daily and crucify our flesh, crucify ourselves. You know, we wake up, we wake up in the morning, we want to be like ourselves again, but we can't. We have to be that new creation in Christ Jesus. And um, we have the victory. We just have to choose to walk in the victory like it's there. So it's really up to us and um, we have to fight for that daily. Um, but notice as we move into verse 14, it says, The blind and the lame came to the temple, and he healed them. So what we see, this is really cool. This is a nice contrast between our Savior and the leaders of that time. Um, we see that Jesus continues to carry on God's compassionate work there in the temple courts. He heals the blind, and he heals um, the lame. And I love this because when you think about Jesus, like he always attracted um, those that had the most need or the greatest needs, but he never sent them away empty-handed, right? He always met their needs to some capacity, right? And when we come to the Lord with our needs, he's going to meet our needs. Now, he may not necessarily meet our needs the way we think he should meet our needs, but he's going to meet our needs in the way he desires to meet our needs in accordance to his will, which is the safest place to be. And God's so good. He do, he'll do that for, for us. He'll do that for anybody uh, who comes to him, just like these individuals. And then notice in verse 15 and 16, it says, When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he, that he did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Okay, these are the children shouting. They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And then Jesus replies, yes, have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. So this is a glimpse of the, the twisted hearts of these religious leaders. They were totally okay with the dishonesty that was taking place in the temple, but they weren't okay with these children, you know, praising the Lord. And it kind of reminded me of Psalm 8. Verse 2, here the psalmist writes, You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who um, oppose you. And when you think about children, young children, and you know, we, have, we have our young children here, we have some young children at this church, and, and we love them so very much. When you think about young children, often their, their words of faith and their love, um, they bring the most beautiful glory to God, like it's genuine. 
when it comes from the, from the children, the small kids. And every time I hear the little ones in here during worship or like in the hallways or like when we're in the fellowship room, you can hear them right now a little bit. Like it's so, it's so cool. It's beautiful because it just reminds you of, of passages like this and, and how the Lord uses our young people, not just our youth, but even the younger ones. And I love it. You think about these, these religious leaders and these people that were unwilling to praise the Lord. So he uses these kids to do it. And that's why it's so important to bring your children to church, to show them the ways of the Lord. That way they don't depart from them later in their life when they go into the world, the world where all the filth is, you know. And, and we know that God can use anyone, including the young children, like he does here, for example, in this instance. Because the truth of the matter is sometimes children are more used to the Lord than we are as adults because of how stubborn we are. And it's just a beautiful thing. And we see this happening here. Um, and then lastly, what we see in verse 17 is that Jesus leaves Jerusalem, okay, and he stays in Bethany. It says, then he left them. He went out of the city um, to Bethany and spent um, the night there. So notice here that uh, this concludes the events of that particular Palm Sunday. And when Jesus left there, Jerusalem, to Bethany, he left behind these in individuals to ponder and to think about all these things um, that they had seen um, on that particular day. So in closing this morning, just to kind of summarize the things we talked about, we talked about the significance of Palm Sunday, the arrival of the King, our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we, what we talked about was the fact that this was an event that was actually predicted about 483 years, almost 500 years before it actually took place. We learned how Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? He made it there lowly, yet with dignity, riding on a borrowed donkey. He came in fulfillment of the, uh, of the scriptures. We notice, too, through the text that he was honored. He was honor honored in two ways. The crowds honored him with their actions, and they honored him verbally. And then the last thing we talked about was the fact that Jesus clean, uh, cleaned house. He cleansed um, the temple. And today, as we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday, and as we prepare to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, a week from today, right, the, the day that Jesus, we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, the greatest event in the history of the world, um, we want to reflect on this final week that Jesus had on his, for his earthly ministry, that he was physically on the planet, as we remember this. But when you think about Jesus raising from the dead, once again, if that wouldn't have happened, like there would be no purpose for us meeting this morning. This would just be like a gathering. We'd be meeting. But the fact that he rose from the dead, coming together to remember that, and to share it with people is a very powerful thing. And, and Lord willing, next week, we'll have people that have, haven't been to church or maybe haven't been to church in a while, and we can remind them of how valuable they are and how loved they are in the Lord. And what I love about Jesus' last week on this planet, um, as we remember Jesus' last week on this planet, is everything that he had to endure and his willingness to surrender to the will of his Father. I'm so grateful for that. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is grateful for that. Because of that, now we have a hope and we have a future in, in Christ Jesus. And what I love about the Lord is that even when we go astray, which I tend to do because I'm not very smart, um, he always has, he's always waiting for us, right? With his arms wide open, because that's what a loving father does. And this morning, maybe you're watching via the live stream, um, or maybe if you're here in person, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, or maybe you need to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, we'll give you that opportunity um, in just a little bit. Because when you think about it, today is the day of salvation because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed this afternoon, right? We could walk out of here and get hit by a bus. We don't know what the Lord's will is for our lives. And that's why we can't wait till the last minute. And we'll give you that opportunity in, in just a little bit here if you're watching on the live stream. Remember what the Gospel of John tells us in John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, that he gave, there's the action, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, um, but have everlasting life. And God loves us so much. He, was, he loves us so much that he was willing to give us his only begotten son, um, Jesus Christ. And he's a loving father. 
He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And unlike the world and unlike the enemy, the Lord will never throw our old sin in our face like the enemy in the world does. He will forgive us because in Christ Jesus, we are new creations, right? The old is gone and the new has come. And as new creations, he sees us as valuable and he loves us. And, um, and we can have the confidence in the Lord that um, we have a hope and we, that we have a future. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, if through faith you have placed your eternal destiny in the loving hands of Jesus Christ, you can be sure that God is at work, shaping the events and circumstances of your life into a beautiful mosaic that will reveal his son to the men and women around you. His hand is on you as it has been since before you were born. And then the Lord tells us through the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 verse 20, and I'll close with this. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we have so much to look forward to, and we can, we can certainly shout with, with great um, fortissimo, if you want to call it, or a great loudness, you know, Hosanna in the highest, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So if you're watching via the live stream this morning, um, or maybe you come across this video at a later time, or maybe you're here in person and um, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, we certainly want to give you that opportunity this morning. You know, today is a day of salvation. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed this afternoon. And we want to make sure that we have that opportunity to, to cry out to the Lord. Um, if that's you this morning, um, all I do is invite you to, to close your eyes and to bow your head and, and to repeat this prayer after me. But you need to repeat this with all your heart. It has to be done wholeheartedly. This is something that you have to do with all your being, with everything that you're made of, your spirit, everything. Just repeat after me. Well, Heavenly Father, uh, this morning I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. Uh, Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of, the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried, and I believe that you rose from the dead uh, three days later. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I am a sinner. I ask that you please forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And please shape me and mold me and use me for your glory. I pray these things. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the, the family of Christ. And as always, as I always tell you, um, even when one sinner repents, there is great joy amongst the angels in heaven. So this, there's a celebration going on on your behalf. And um, if you have any questions about maybe your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, maybe you need to get connected with a Bible teaching church, you need to get connected with brothers and sisters in the Lord, um, I invite you to, to call us, come visit us. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Um, our building is located at the intersection of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. And um, next week, I invite you to come. Um, as we celebrate Easter Sunday, Pastor Angel will be back, and um, we know that the Lord is preparing him to bring forth a beautiful message of encouragement and hope, and we want to invite you. We ask you to invite someone and, um, and just come by. This is not a place for judgment or condemnation, but a place for hope and for love, and um, we hope that you have a blessed week. We're praying for you. We love you very much, and um, we hope to see you again soon, so, so bye for now.